let's uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer and uh, ask his blessings on our time here this evening. Heavenly Father, we love you. We, we want to serve you. We want to worship you. Uh, Father, not because we're trying to trying to get something from you. Father, you have you have freely given us more than we could ever, ever um, imagine uh, or ask for, Lord, in uh, providing salvation for us. And so uh, we want to love you and worship you and serve you just out of our thankfulness. Uh, Father, that's why we gather together. It's why we study your word. It's why we try to try to serve you with our lives, Father, just because you've done so much for us and you've you have called us to live uh, for your glory and according to your plans and purposes for our lives. Father, we, uh, we, we lift up um, the, the whole Brooks family, Camaletti family. Father, we just ask that you would just encourage them, comfort them, strengthen them moment by moment, Lord. Uh, Father, we just, we just ask your, your blessings and your, uh, your presence in their lives. Uh, Father, we, we ask for rest for them. Uh, we ask for a peace in their hearts, Lord. Uh, we just we ask for you to do for them what only you can do for them. Father, we want to come alongside them and encourage them and comfort them as best we can. Uh, but, Father, they need supernatural strength and supernatural comfort, and so we just ask you for that. Uh, Father, I, I pray for this one who has been in this accident. Father, I just um, ask that you would be with her. Whatever surgery she's having, um, she might even be having some right now, Lord. I just pray that you would work through those doctors and nurses. Father, we just pray for healing for her. Father, we pray for the uh, families of those who lost their lives in this accident uh, last night. Father, we, we just pray for them. God, we ask that you would comfort them, provide uh, provide friends and family uh, just to, to be there alongside them and encourage them uh, through through their loss. Uh, Father, we, we ask for your, your love and, and mercy and comfort in their lives. Uh, Father, we, uh, we thank you for the opportunities that we had to serve you. Uh, Father, we thank you for the opportunities we had this, this past weekend. Uh, on Thursday, uh, we fed the Spring Festival workers and some of the city employees here. Father, um, thank you for that opportunity. We thank you for the gospel conversations that happened. Father, we, pr- we pray that uh, those seeds that were planted would, uh, would grow and produce fruit, Father, and there would be, um, there would be salvations that come as a result of that. Father, we thank you for the uh, many people that we were able to, to interact with and meet on Saturday. And uh, Father, for those that we met that are looking for a, looking for a church home, uh, Father, we pray that, uh, that you would um, just impress it upon their hearts the need for a church family, Father, and if they choose to come and, and visit here, Father, I pray that we would love them and welcome them and, and, uh, and uh, preach the gospel to them. Father, we, uh, we pray for those that we may have interacted with that don't know you as their Lord and Savior. And Father, maybe there's something that we said or something that we gave them that uh, would, uh, would get them thinking about their, their sin and their need for a Savior. And uh, Father, that you would uh, work salvation in their hearts and lives. Father, um, we, uh, we pray for uh, Jonathan and Chelsea. Father, I just lift them up. Uh, their family. Father, they've got a lot of stuff going on this summer as they get ready to launch this new church there in Mission Hill. Uh, Father, we pray that you would just uh, provide for their every need. Father, we pray that you would provide the resources that they need, whether it's money or people or or supplies or just energy, uh, whatever they need, Lord. We just ask that you would provide that for them. Father, I pray that um, you would um, you would put it on folks' hearts here that are able to, to go, Father, that you would call them. Uh, to go um, in August, September, uh, Father, for that trip, we just uh, ask that you would um, impress it upon our hearts to be involved in whatever way we're able to be involved in that trip, and you would provide all the people that, uh, that are needed to, uh, to make this outreach happen on September the 1st. Uh, Father, we, we would do these things uh, not because we, we are just looking for something to do, not because uh, we don't know what else to do. Father, we do these things because you've you commanded us to go and make disciples of all nations. Father, um, there's a lot of things we could do, but Father, if we're not doing that, Lord, we're failing you. We are, we are, we've missed, we've missed, um, completely missed the calling that you have placed on every single one of our lives. 
And as we minister to the gospel of Jesus Christ for those, those we know, Father, whether it's in a one-on-one conversation or whether we uh, have opportunities to speak to larger numbers of people, whatever it is, Father, you've called us to, to speak the gospel to folks. And I just pray that we would, uh, we would be obedient to that. Fathers, we uh, have gathered here tonight. We just want you to be honored and glorified. Father, we ask that you would um, help us to help learn to love you more through our study of your word that we would grow in our understanding of, of you and of uh, your plan of salvation, and that that would cause us to um, become more like Jesus, that it would cause us to, to want to share this gospel message with other people, that we would grow in our ability to clearly explain the truths found in your word, to clearly explain who Jesus is and, and what this plan of salvation is. Uh, Father, we just want you to use this time for your honor and for your glory. It's in the name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. All righty. Uh, if you got your Bible, I'll tell you where to turn in just a minute, okay? Uh, I'm just going to listen for, for a couple of minutes, and we'll talk, and then I'll tell you where to turn. Uh, we are continuing our study called The Big Picture of the Bible, and, uh, and so we, we, are, we are tonight... We, we get to the promised one. I've been excited to get here. Uh, it's been a journey as we've got in our, in our plane and we've traveled and, um, and we have landed in some places in God's word and we've got out, that, out of that plane and we have uh, met some of the people and we have uh, seen some of the culture and, and uh, seen what the Lord was doing there in that time and then we got back in that plane and we've taken off and um, kind of breezed over some other places in God's word and then landed again and we've we see that these places where we've landed are connected together. They're connected. And, uh, and, and, and all of this is telling one big story. Uh, it's a story of redemption. And so uh, I, I hope and pray that as we've walked through several places in the Old Testament, uh, our, our desire is that we would get excited about this promised one and his coming. Uh, just, just think about if you knew nothing about Jesus, didn't know who he was, and you're reading about creation and how it was good, and then there was a curse, but then God promised to fix the curse. And then, and then you go a little bit further and, and you read about a flood, and it's tragic, but then you see that God rescued someone. And then you go a little further and you learn about the birth of this nation. And you get these clues about who this promised one is going to be and, and where he's going to come from and what he's going to do. And, and you start putting these things together and the excitement starts to build. Who is, who is this promise? When is he going to get here? And, and there should be a, a, a level of anticipation and excitement that, uh, that grows inside of us. Sometimes, sometimes if we have grown up in church or at least been in church for a while, um, study God's word for a while, a danger is that we lose some of the sense of excitement about the coming of the promised one. We don't want to lose that. Uh, we want to we be more excited uh, the last day of our life here on the earth of us being saved and walking with the Lord than we were the moment that we trusted in Christ. And, uh, and so we want to grow in our anticipation of that. Um, I'll tell you this, one of the one of the best ways to, to stay excited about the gospel is to share it with people that don't know. <laughs> because their excitement in under, beginning to understand who Jesus is and then trusting Christ, it overflows. And, man, it, it fuels our fire um, to, to share the good news of the gospel with folks and, and just to love Jesus more and, and stay excited about who Jesus is and what he's done. So let's, uh, let's jump in, and we will... Um, Ask a few questions that we always ask, and uh, y'all be able to answer those real quick, and then we'll, uh, we'll jump into uh, the promised one and uh, his coming here to the earth. So, uh, first question we always ask, I'm going to ask this quickly, y'all answer quickly, what is the Bible? Yes, to who? All the peoples, yes. That's not what I'm looking at here. <laughs> Well, that's good. I'll look at that. That's, that's, that's right. Okay. Um, I'll sit here working on it. And, all right. We'll see what happens. Um, 
God's written revelation of himself to all the peoples. That's good news. It's not just for a group of people. It's for all peoples. Um, okay. I might have to pause for just a second, y'all. I apologize. Anybody know what the next question is? Yeah, what's it about? Yes, God's plan for the redemption of mankind through the promised one. Excellent. Promise and fulfillment of God's plan of salvation through Jesus. Hey, I'm going to close this, and I'm going to open it, and then see if it just magically starts working again. There we go. We're back on track. Thank you. It's just you just getting up and pretending like you were going to go fix it, fixed it. <laughs> That's how good Matt Trainer is. <laughs> All right. Here we go. We're, we're good. It just went to sleep on me. Um, y'all don't go to sleep on me. Y'all don't go to sleep on me. Okay. Um, all right. Here we go. Uh, three questions. What are our three questions? Anybody know what's the first one? We gotta ha- we gotta have these questions and get our answers right, or we miss the whole picture. Who is Satan? Who is he? Enemy of God. Second question. What choice do they make? Sin. And third question. What did God promise? What did He promise? Yes, a savior. A what? Say. Man born of woman destroy Satan. Yeah, man born of woman who would destroy Satan. I, see, here's the problem. I have to, I, I don't hear very good, and so, right? <laughs> and so the bar was going right across your mouth, and so I have to, like, read your lips as you're talking. I couldn't see your lips, so I couldn't hear you. That was the, that was the problem. Um, I, could, I could hear noise, but I needed to see your lips. Uh, okay, so uh, here we go. Just a, I'm not even going to do that. I'm going to jump ahead. I want to review where we were our last time together because this bridges the gap between the Old Testament and the New Testament. Um, there's a new covenant prophecy, and so I just want to list, the, um, for us to list the four or five benefits of the new covenant. Um, In the Old Testament, God promised a new covenant with his people, and this is what that covenant would involve. Because this gets us excited about the promised one, because these are things that we want, we need. Uh, First one is that God would change the hearts of people to love and obey him. We desperately need our hearts changed, um, and we need it from the inside out. Uh, That's the Holy Spirit. We talked about that this morning. We need the Holy Spirit to change us from the inside out. God said he would restore the relationship between himself and people. We need our relationship between us and God restored. Um, He said that that relationship would be a personal relationship, not some abstract relationship, not something where I had to go through somebody else, a priest or something, but I would have personally a personal relationship with God. And then the way that all that's possible for him to change our hearts, store a relationship, give us a personal relationship with him, is that he would have to do something about our sin. And what he's going to do with it is forgive it. All right, he's going to forgive our sin, and uh, simply means to not hold our, not he's not going to hold our sin against us, and that's what forgiveness means. And so that's what we're looking for is this new covenant to take place, but it's only going to happen through a promised one. It's the only way it's going to happen. So we get to the promised one when we get to the New Testament, and so that's where we're going to be today. And that New Testament, oh going crazy. I was going to ask you a hard question. I was going to say, who is the promised one? Well, the promised one is who? Jesus. Okay. Man, I knew, I, I was just going to ask a question. I knew everybody could get that one right, and I gave you the answer before I let you do it. Um, sorry, this technology is not working good today. So let's jump in. Jesus Christ. Um, we're in the New Testament. Uh, just a quick overview of the New Testament, um, at least how it starts. The New Testament describes how God fulfills the new covenant. Um, We start in the New Testament with the first four books. What do we call those? The Gospels. Yeah, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They're biographies of the promised one 
or Jesus. These books were written from different perspectives, but they all agree with one another. It's pretty neat. Uh, different perspectives, but they all agree. And these four biographies of Jesus, as we said, are called the Gospels. Uh, what does the word gospel mean? Good news, good news. Uh, that's, all, that's all that word means is good news. Um, what's, what's this good news? Thinking about the big picture, the promised one, what's this good news? Okay, okay. So we can no longer be separated from him? Absolutely. We'll say this for now. The good news is that we finally get to see the long-awaited promised one who's going to fix our relationship with God. I mean, a whole Old Testament, we're just like, wait, when is it going to get here? 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 And finally, mm, there, there is the promised one. And uh, because of what Jesus has done for us, we... Um, We're able now to look back on these events and understand just how good this arrival of the promised one is. Now, we looked at several prophecies and, uh, a couple weeks ago, and these events in the Gospels took, took place about 600 years after the prophecy of, say, Jeremiah. And that's the one who prophesied about the new covenant. So about 600 years goes by, um, and uh, so... Seems like a pretty long time, but God is a God who keeps his promises. And it may not happen in our timing, but in the fullness of time, right? The fullness of time, God sent forth his son at just the right time. So I'm going to put up our um, big picture timeline, and we're going to add to it. These are all the places that we've been so far in our study. And then we're going to zoom up on this section right here and look at about a 33-year period. We're just going to start at the beginning of that period this evening with the birth of Jesus, the promised one. Uh, Jesus was born sometime around 3 B.C. to 0 A.D. or B.C., however you want to say. I don't know I don't know which letters you put with the year 0. I guess you either one, and it worked. Um, and so... Uh, a lot of research now says, and as we look at the chronology of the life of Jesus and, um, and then compare that to the Roman rulers at that time and uh, just what was going on, uh, probably it, he was born about 3 B.C., uh, but uh, yeah. No, that would actually create the B.C., because there was no before Christ until there is a Christ, in a way. No, you, are you talking about the fact that it was 3 B.C.? Yeah, yeah. So probably whenever the, the calendar was made, um, there wasn't as much uh, just scholarship and archaeological evidence and all that stuff to be able to pinpoint the exact time, and so they got close to it. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, sometime, sometime around 3 B.C. is probably... Um, the best, best place to put his birth. The, the bottom line, though, is that the coming of Christ split history in two. It split it into two. Our calendar is, is organized around the birth of a little boy to some peasant parents in a no-name town called Bethlehem. And it completely split the human calendar into two. And so for someone to ever say that, ah, Jesus is just, you know, another prophet or something, there's, yeah, there's something, something bigger about this person, about this birth. So let's look at it for just a, just, just a few minutes. Luke, that's where you can go if you want to turn in your Bibles. Luke, chapter 1. Um, some of this will be familiar to you, some of it may not, uh, but we want to look at it and see, uh, see about this coming promised one. Um, I had given you, and you may have brought it with you a couple weeks ago, a sheet that had prophecies on it, and I forgot to grab them out of my office. Um, but we're only going to do five of them tonight, and so if you don't have it with you, um, you'll only miss five of them, and that'll be okay. But as we go, if you have that sheet, you'll see prophecy number one, prophecy number two, prophecy number three pop up, and that corresponds to that sheet 
I'll hand it, if you don't have one, I'll give you one on your way out the door tonight, and, um, and you'll have it for next week, and I'll make sure I have them in here. Uh, well, not next week. Next time we're together in here on Sunday night. Uh, but verse 26, Luke chapter 1. Verse 26, Luke chapter 1. All of history, all of history is leading up to this right here. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one. The Lord is with you. We talked about this this morning. God is the author of salvation. It's his doing from beginning to end. And so Mary's not sitting around going, Hey, God, when are you going to send that angel down? You know, God initiates it all. And so he knowing that this is the fullness of time, this is the right time for the Messiah to come in human history, he sends his messenger, Gabriel, to this, um, to this woman whose name is Mary. And uh, so starts the coming of the promised one. Uh, Mary is soon to be married to a man named Joseph. That's what uh, betrothal means. They weren't married yet. Um, Betrothal in those days and times were it was it was more than an engagement. What we would consider today an engagement, um, it was it was even more of a commitment uh, than than our modern day engagement. But you weren't married yet, and uh, but but they are they are going to get married. There's always already a pretty pretty large commitment on David's part to this woman named Mary, and we'll talk about that again in just just a minute. But something unique about this woman is that she is a virgin. And so the angel comes to her and says, the Lord is with you. Verse 29, but she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. There's no asking, there's just telling. Hey, Mary, you will conceive in your womb, and you will bear a son, and you will call him Jesus. This is God's doing. He has a plan, and it involves this young lady named Mary. So Mary's going to become pregnant with a son, and she's going to call his name Jesus. Anybody know what the name Jesus means? Yeah, pretty much. I don't know who said that. Savior. Yeah, there you go. Um, Savior. It means, we we could translate it as the God who saves. God who saves. It comes from the Hebrew name. Anybody know the Hebrew name that Jesus? It's, it's, that's part of it, but that's not the whole name. Yes, which, which would be the name Joshua. Joshua. It, it, it originates with that Hebrew name, Joshua, but it would be pronounced Yeshua. And so um, it's got the part of Yahweh, part of the name Yahweh in there, the Lord or the God. Uh, who saves, and then the, the Hebrew word for salvation is a combination of that, Yahweh who, who saves. Um, so basically, Savior is, is, what that, is what his name literally means. You shall call his name the one who saves, is what the angel is saying. Verse 32, he will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High. He'll be great, and he'll be called the Son of the Most High. So, sent in rocket science, Jesus would be great. It's a word we've seen several times, right? I'm going to make your name great, God told to Abraham. I'll make your name great, God told to David. And now comes the one who is great. And he's the son of the Most High. What's that mean? What's this tell us about this baby that's going to be born? He's, yeah, he is, he is the son of God. He is divine. He is the son of the Most High. Not your everyday baby. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father, David. What what bells ought to start ringing in our brains when we read this? Yes, that David would always have someone on the throne. That there would be an offspring of David who would be a forever king on a forever throne. And and even kind of simpler than that, just that he would be a descendant of, of David. Okay, but but 
that he will reign as king. He will give to him the throne of his father, David. So he's going to be a descendant of David, who was a king of Israel, and he's going to reign. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. There we go. We got that whole, that whole um, Sunday that we studied uh, uh, David, and we looked in uh, 2 Samuel 7, I believe it is, and we saw where God promised a forever king on a forever throne, and it couldn't be Solomon, and it couldn't be Solomon's son. It could, who's it going to be? It's going to be somebody that could live forever. Well, that's going to have to be God. Well, but it's got to be a son of David. So how is David going to have, an, have a descendant who is God? How's that going to work? A virgin named Mary who would give birth to a child without ever having known a man. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yes, right on. This is, I like the way you said it. It says shout out. It's God shout out to people. Look, keep looking at this lineage. Keep looking because at some point in the line of David, um, there's coming a forever king on a forever throne. And so that's what I got right here. Um, again, that, that prophecy number one, that corresponds to a sheet. And if you don't have that, don't worry. I'll get that to you um, when we're finished. Forever king on a forever throne. And Mary said to the angel, how is this going to happen? That's my translation. Um, how will this be? Since I am a virgin. And the angel answered her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. God's going to do it. The child to be born will be called holy, the son of God. What kind of, what kind of sacrifice was required of the people of Israel when they were enslaved to the Egyptians? A blood sacrifice. So what kind of blood sacrifice was required to allow them to escape death, the death of the firstborn? perfect lamb they had to find a blood sac an unblemished yeah, had to find a blood sacrifice but it had to be the perfect one couldn't be the one that was crippled couldn't be the one that had a disease it had to be a perfect lamb why because the sacrifice had to be holy right god god required a perfect sacrifice it's the only sacrifice that will suffice so now we have someone going to be born who is going to be a forever king on a forever throne descended from david who is the Son of God and will be called holy, which means he is perfect. He is perfect. See what this is shaping up to be? Shaping up to be the promised one we're looking for. That's what it's shaping up to be. Holy, perfect, spotless, innocent. In other words, he would never sin. He would never sin. All right, let's go to Matthew. Go back, Matthew. You can look on the screen. I'm going to have it on the screen. But if you want to see where it is in your Bible, that's good too. Matthew chapter 1. Matthew starts with what? A good old genealogy. Yeah. Those things that sometimes when you're reading your Bible, you're like, and I think I'll skip ahead a little bit. Because <laughs> um, a lot of hard names to pronounce and it just kind of gets repetitious. But genealogies are in the Bible for a reason. And, um, and this is there for a reason. The book of, gene of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Why would Matthew start out his gospel by saying, the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham? Why would he say that? Yeah, yeah. So he starts his book out by saying, the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Let me, put it, let me put it in my words. He's saying, hey, Jewish people, I'm fixing to tell you about the promised one. That's what he's saying. That's what it should have meant in their minds. I'm fixing to, I'm fixing to connect all of our history together, and it is going to culminate in the person of Jesus Christ. So let's jump to verse 17. So all the generations from Abraham to David were 14 generations from David to the deportation to Babylon. We talked about that. That's the exile. 
14 generations and from the deportation to Babylon to the Christ, 14 generations. So he just does big picture of the Bible in about one minute, okay? That's what, that's what he's doing there. He's doing big picture of the Bible, Bible study in about two minutes uh, by giving this genealogy. Connects Abraham to David to the Christ. That is the Messiah. The genealogy is given that traces the lineage from Abraham to David to the Israelites exiled to Babylon to the Christ. What does the word Christ mean? Anybody know? Anybody want to guess? Do what? Anointed one. There you go. Several different ways that we could say it. A lot, uh, pretty, uh, that, that anointed one is probably the best translation of Christ. Christ is a Greek word that is the Greek translation of a Hebrew word, which is the word we call Messiah. So the word Christ and Messiah is the same word, just in two different languages. Messiah is English, English, English-sized version of, um, of the Hebrew word, and Christ is the English translation of the Greek word, and they both mean the anointed one, or we could say the promised one. We could say that's referring to the promised one. It's the one that's a long-awaited one. It's another way you could translate it, a long-awaited one, anointed one, long-awaited one, promised one. Um, so he will be, he was the Christ. So tracing this right to this promised one, the one that they have waited on for so long. Verse 18, the birth, now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. Her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. So, Luke's gospel in the birth of Jesus is going to focus on who? Mary or Joseph? Mary. Matthew's going to focus on Joseph. Two different perspectives telling the same story. It's pretty neat, right? So, here we got the focus on Joseph. Verse 20. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David. There we go. Like key, key marker. Joseph. Remember, your son of David. That's who the promised one is going to come through. Do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. Remember, that means the one who saves. But he gives the explanation. For he will save his people from their sins. This is one of my favorite verses in the Bible. I have lots of favorite verses, but this is one of my favorite verses. Um, because... We get the mission of Jesus, why he came. It's a very simple, short phrase. Call him Jesus. Call him the Savior because he will save his people from their sins. Very particular reason why Jesus came. Yes, he did miracles. We'll talk about those at a later date. Yes, he said a lot of good things. We'll talk about some of those things that he said at another time. But he came for one particular purpose, to save his people from their sins. And here's one of my favorite words in this verse. It's the word will. For he will save his people from their sins. I love that. I love that. There's no if, there's no might, there's no hopefully he will, there's no I'm going to send him, we'll see how it works out. There's not even, there's not even, He's going to save his people from, his, from their sins if they will do this, this, and this. Remember, that's what the law was about. If you are able to do this and this and this, then, then you will have life. But we've already realized we can't do this and this and this and this because of our sin. And so this new covenant is all about him. Do you remember um, uh, a couple weeks ago, uh, I put, actually, I think it, I'm going to just stick it up there quick to it. Thing some more. I gotta get back to the right spot in just a second. Remember this in the new covenant. Remember that a couple weeks ago. I will. I will. I will. I will. I will. I will. This is back in Jeremiah, six hundred years before the the birth of Christ, and God says, "I am going to do this." That's what's so good about the new covenant is that it's all dependent upon God to do it. Not if you are able to obey these commands, then you can have life, but. This time, I'm going to give it to you freely. I'm going to give it to you as a free gift. I will, I will, I will, I will. Then we get to the coming of Jesus, and we have that beautiful word, will. 
he will save his people from their sins. This speaks to all sorts of issues in our lives, all sorts of doctrinal issues. One, I'll just bring this one out, is security of our salvation. If I belong to God, if I've been talked about this morning, adoption, if I've been adopted by God, I am saved and I will be saved. And there's no changing that. If I've trusted Christ as my Lord and Savior, I'm not, I'm not losing that gift of salvation. Because Jesus will save his people from their sins. Um, so Jesus is going to be a descendant of David. He tells Joseph the same thing he tells Mary. Um, he's going to be the son of God, same thing he told Mary. He's going to be the Savior, the Rescuer, same thing he told Mary. Verse 22, and all this took place to fulfill what the Lord has spoken by the prophet. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord has spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. Anybody know where that prophecy comes from? There you go, Isaiah. You had to guess either Isaiah or Jeremiah, because those are the ones that we highlighted. Um, Isaiah. Jesus would be born of a virgin. He would be God with us. Born of a virgin, God with us. Again, fulfilling prophecies. Let's keep going to Matthew. Uh, let's stop for a second. Let's summarize what we've, what we've looked at so far. So Jesus is going to be born of a woman. What's that mean about Jesus if he's born of a woman? Human. Jesus is born of God. What's that mean? He's going to be God. He's fully God. Why is this important for the gospel? Okay. Yeah. Right. Because what do we get from Adam? Sin. In Adam, all die. Read Romans chapter 5. Uh, there's death through Adam. So we needed a perfect sacrifice. So we could not have a connection with Adam. But why do we need him to be, still be human? Why can't it just be God coming as God and not human? Yeah, why, is he, why would we need somebody like us? To, 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 to experience things that we, so we can identify with us? To our high priest, to be our substitute, right? To be our substitute. We needed someone like us to be a substitute for us, but we needed that person to be perfect. And this is why, this is why we have to, we have to always stand firm on our Christology. That's our doctrine of who Jesus is. So there are some people who would say, um, yeah, Jesus came and he died on the cross and and if you say, well, who is Jesus? Um, and you begin to ask questions, uh, you would realize that they don't believe that Jesus is fully God. They still believe that he came and died on the cross or died in some way for sin. But they don't believe that Jesus is fully God. And so I don't say, well, at least you believe that Jesus died on the cross, so we believe the same thing. No, because a Jesus that isn't God and dies on a cross accomplishes nothing. So just because you believe that Jesus died on the cross, if you don't believe that Jesus is fully God, then you have no gospel. You have no good news. And the opposite is true as well. You believe that God came to earth, but he was really God. He just kind of looked like a human, but he really wasn't human. Well, now I don't have a substitute. I have someone who's perfect, but he can't take my place because he's not human like me. So this is at the heart of the gospel. This is what we would call a level one uh, piece of theology. What I mean by level one, I mean if, we, if somebody doesn't believe this, they're, n they're not a Christian. There are other theological things that we can disagree on and we can still be brothers and sisters in Christ. I still would call that person a, a, a believer even though it may disagree on this point of doctrine. But this is something that's a level one. You, you don't believe this, then you don't have a Jesus that can save you from your sin. So important. All right, verse 24. 
When Joseph woke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. Uh, we could talk for a while about the position that Joseph was in, being betrothed to a woman, not being married to her. She finds out she's pregnant. Um, he wanted to divorce her quietly. We read that. He was a just man. Uh, we don't have time to go into all that. Um, he, did, he had the right, we'll put it this way, he had the right, legal right, to not divorce her quietly, but to end that relationship in a very public way that would have humiliated Mary. Um, but he was obedient to the Lord. He trusted God's word, that God was good, and that God had a plan. And so he did exactly what the angel of the Lord commanded him to do. He had faith. He trusted in God. He obeyed him. Let's jump back to the book of Luke. Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2. Be in verses 1 through 7. In those days... A decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. You think that was an accident? In the fullness of time, at just the right time, God sent forth his son. What happened when, 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 you had to, when, when there was a census that took place, when you had to be registered? What did you have to do? You got to go to your hometown. You got to go to your hometown. Caesar ordered a census of the Roman Empire. Where's Joseph from? What's his hometown? What's the, what's the city of his people? Bethlehem. It's the city of David. Verse 4, Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth, to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David. Do you think, you think Matthew's trying to make a point here? I mean, he's like saying this stuff over and over again. He's, he's, he's saying most likely uh, Matthew wrote his gospel primarily, at, the, at least at the beginning, for the Jewish people, because we have lots and lots of references to the Old Testament. He probably wrote this for his people initially so that they would understand who the Messiah was. But of course, it's, it's useful for all people, uh, but he is hammering in this, this, uh, this fact, these facts that this baby that's going to be born, he is connected to David. The city of David was called Bethlehem because he was a house and lineage of David. Verse 6, and while they were there, the time came for her to give birth, and she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. Continuing to fulfill prophecies. Verse 25, now was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and this man was righteous and devout waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. Man in Jerusalem, I love, Simeon is one of my favorite biblical characters because he had a lot of wisdom, and he got, he got uh, the coolest promise just about anybody ever got in the, in the Bible, and uh, he says some really neat things. So that's, he's one of my favorite people, Simeon. Uh, Simeon was a man who had faith in God, tried to obey him. He was righteous and devout. Verse 26, and it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. That's a cool promise. You've got thousands of years worth of prophecies that one day there's going to be a promised one. One day the Messiah is going to come. And then you're Simeon, and one day the Lord reveals to you, guess what? Guess what? Before you die, you're going to get to see the promised one. That's awesome. I mean, you're going to get to see the one that was promised back in Genesis chapter 3 in the Garden of Eden. Hey, Simeon, you remember in your Bible, you remember in, the, in, your, in your scriptures back that story about Adam and Eve back in Genesis? You remember that promise that was there? Guess what? You're going to get to see that person before you die. I can't, I, can, I don't know, I don't know how long, the Bible doesn't tell us how uh, long beforehand God revealed that to Simeon. But uh, I hope for his sake, it, he didn't have to wait too long after hearing that promise. Because I would have got up every day and be like, all right, all right, Lord, day to day. You know, we, I'm going to see him today. I go to bed and, oh, man, come on, God. You know, when it's going to be tomorrow. Um, and, uh, and so, anyways, I, 
he had to wake up every day excited because God had revealed to him that he would see the promised one before he died. And we get to verse 27. And he came in the spirit into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, they come in, Simeon's there, Mary and Joseph bring him in. Of course, the custom of the law is uh, for, was for a male child to be circumcised on the eighth day. So they bring him in for all of that. They meet Simeon. Verse 28, he took him up in his arms. This is a picture of this. Simeon takes this baby, this baby Jesus in his arms, and he blesses God. He, he praises God, and he says this. He says, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. Oh, man. What profound words. My eyes have seen your salvation. I don't know who all was standing around. I'm sure Mary and Joseph were standing there. I don't know who else was standing around there. It might have been a busy day in the temple and lots of people moving around. But can you imagine hearing this very righteous, devout man, and he, and, and he says, my eyes have seen the salvation of the Lord. And they're probably like, where? Where, Simeon? Where? Right here. What? That's a little baby. How in the world can that be the salvation of the people of Israel? And not just of Israel, but of the nations. You prepared in the presence of all peoples a light for revelation to the Gentiles and glory to your people, Israel. The Simeon is saying that Jesus, this little baby, had come for all the peoples. Remember, remember the Tower of Babel? Confusion of languages? And now you got scattered across the earth. All these various ethnic groups, they speak these different languages. I mean, how, how, how are these people going to be united into one? They can't even communicate with each other. And here it is. Here's the answer to that problem. Here's God's fix. And it's a little bitty baby. Probably crying. Needed his diaper changed. Little, little helpless, helpless little baby. And this is salvation. That's God right there. That's God. He always works in ways that, from a human standpoint, what? That's why the gospel is so different than any man made way of salvation, any man made religion on the face of this earth. The gospel is so different. Because we would never think this up. We would never come up with this way of salvation. But it's God's way. And he does it in a way that we say, yep, this is God's doing, and therefore he gets all the credit. One more quick story we want to look at. This is familiar to you. Matthew chapter 2. If you want to turn there, you can. I'm going to jump into it real fast. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, Wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. We've got, we've got wise men. Now, oftentimes we think of just wise men, and we think about, yeah, they were wise, okay? They were kingly. But sometimes we read over the fact of where they came from. They came from a foreign land. These aren't Jews that were hanging out somewhere around Jerusalem, but they were really wise. These are people that are not Jewish, and they've come from a faraway land, Gentiles, to worship this Jesus. This Jesus is the Savior of the world, and we see that even from his birth. From what Simeon says, and from these foreigners coming in to Jerusalem to worship this little baby. Now... Herod's not on board with all this, of course. King Herod heard this. He's troubled. Why is he troubled? Why does he not like this? He want, yeah, he don't like that there's another king in town. He wants to be the, the as funny as Herod's really a puppet king. Rome is in charge, but still, he's mad. He thinks he's the, he's the big shot, and he doesn't want anybody to come in and take his place. 
Uh, we're going to skip ahead a little bit. Verse 9, after listening to the king, they went on their way, and behold, the star that they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary his mother, and they fell down, and they worshipped him. Yeah, this little baby, Simeon says, behold, salvation to the world. And you've got this young child, might not have been a baby at that point, but very young child. And you've got these people that just traveled, who knows how far. They're from another, uh, some other country. They come in and they worship this child. This isn't just any child. King of kings. Lord of lords, worthy of worship. They give him some gifts. They give him gold and frankincense and myrrh. And then they head back. They go back to their own country. Of course, they go by another way because Herod, he didn't like all this, and he was going to try to kill Jesus. So God's going to protect his promise. Satan wants to thwart God's promise. Remember, he's the enemy. Remember our questions? Satan's not done working. He wants, he wants to get rid of this child. He doesn't want him there. And so Herod says, hey, we're going to kill all these children. But God's not going to, his plan is not going to be thwarted. So in verse 13, we find this. Now when they had departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. And he said, rise, take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt and remain there until I tell you. For Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. And he rose and he took the child and his mother by night and departed to Egypt and remained there until the death of Herod, this was to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Out of Egypt, I called my son. Wow. Even that was a part of God's plan. Even that. Somehow, somehow, he had to get Jesus to Egypt to fulfill that part of the prophecy. But guess what he does? He does. He takes the sin of an of a earthly king, and he uses that in his plan to point to this baby as the promised one. He had already said, out of Egypt, I called my son. And now, guess what? Jesus, born in Bethlehem, also is going to come up out of Egypt. Herod wants to kill Jesus, and Joseph takes his family to Jesus. Verse 19, when Herod died, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt, saying, Rise, take the child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel, for those who sought the child's life are dead. And so Joseph gets up with his family, and he takes this child and his mother, and he goes back to the land of Israel. All right, so wrapping up, what do we learn? That God promised to give a new covenant, which provide all of these blessings, and he's going to do that through his promised one, that Jesus is the promised one. He's born of a virgin in Bethlehem. It's very important because he's fully God and fully human. Jesus had come for all peoples, not just for the Jews. That is good news. That's the good news of the gospel. So, it may have taken a long time, but God kept his promise to send the promised one. And that is none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. The question then, the question then is, what's he going to do to fix the problem of sin? What's this baby going to grow up to do so the problem of sin is fixed? Um, just think about all of these details with the coming of Christ and fulfilling prophecy at just the right time, getting Joseph to Bethlehem, and then getting Jesus to Egypt, and then Simeon, a Jew, and foreigners from a faraway land, both worshiping this child, pointing to the fact that this is a worldwide event, even though only a few people at this point know about it. God says, I will, I will, I will. It's his plan of salvation, and he will accomplish it. It's the good news of the gospel. Uh, we want to worship God for his sovereign plan of salvation. That he, he, he made it happen, brought together all the details, and we want to share this good news with other people. The promised one is none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for being here with us. Thank you for living in us through your Holy Spirit. 
Father, thank you that in the fullness of time you sent forth your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you that uh, you are a God who's able to make all of these prophecies about the promised one and then fulfill them. And uh, Father, so that there's, there's no denying that this baby is from you and that he was the one that people have been waiting on for so, so long, that he was the one who would be that promised one. And Father, we worship you. We thank you for that. Help us to live our lives for the, for the praise, the glory of this one who was born as a baby, fully God, fully man, to save his people from their sins. In Jesus' name, amen.